you know, consistency is huge, even if it's not 100% because people will beat themselves up also if they're not doing it 100% of the time. But if most of the time you're doing what you are aligned to do as far as your vision and what your goals are, you're going to get there. Hey guys, it's Corey from Redefining Strength. Welcome to the Fitness Hacks Podcast. Today we're going to talk about body recomp, gaining muscle as you lose fat or losing fat as you gain muscle and how you can really accomplish this because it is possible even if it's summarized as a slower process. So to start, I'm gonna cover whether or not you need a calorie surplus or a calorie deficit based on your goals. I'm then gonna sum up what it takes to see results in three words, although I will use a ton more words to explain why those three words are so key. I'll then dive into an interview with Christy Basu of Eat Me Guilt Free. She's gonna share how you can enjoy the foods that you love and strike that healthy lifestyle balance. Then I actually wanna share some easy meal prep ideas six different staples and six different ways because I think you can really get creative with your meal prep even while keeping it simple. And then we'll dive into why body part splits might not be the best option if you wanna see body recomp. So let's get started. So you wanna gain muscle and you wanna lose fat or maybe you wanna lose fat but you also wanna gain muscle. How many calories do you really need? And ultimately your primary focus will dictate your calorie intake. So if you're thinking, I want to lose some fat or stay as lean as I am, but I really wanna focus on building muscle, you're gonna err towards more of that side of in that calorie surplus. However, if your focus first and foremost is on losing fat, you might think, okay, I'm gonna be in that calorie deficit. But this is where really being strategic with your calories matters most. So yes, we do need to always have that primary focus that will dictate how many calories we need. Again. For focusing first on gaining muscle, you'll want that surplus. Focusing first on losing fat, you'll want that deficit. Now, where we can make both work is based on our macros. Macros matter most for body recomp. If you go too extreme with the surplus or go too extreme with the deficit, you're not gonna see the results that you want, either gaining a ton of unwanted fat or actually losing muscle. But where we can sort of control for that body recomp of gaining muscle as we lose fat is how we dial in our macros, especially our protein. Okay, so a good rule of thumb is 30% protein hits that high protein mark and that's the minimum we wanna shoot for. If we're getting about that 30% of our calorie intake coming from protein, we're going to see better body recomposition, whether we do the surplus or the deficit, okay? So you wanna think, how can I increase my protein intake? And then you can adjust your carbs and fat based on your actual goals. So as we're trying to lose fat, we have a lot more flexibility in the carb and fat intake, and we might even find that we're adapted to one thing more than the other. The more active we are, the more we want, might wanna emphasize carbs as well. However, when we're trying to gain muscle as our primary focus, especially when we are already lean and we're training intensely, carbs need to also be something that we prioritize. It can be hard, especially if you've just lost weight, to want to increase those carbs, especially if you were on a lower carb ratio, but it's really key. Now, I do wanna note that you might see that quick increase on the scale when you do refill those glycogen stores, when you see water weight being gained because of increasing your carb intake, and that is normal and natural. You have to embrace that process. But macros really matter if we want that body recomp and to control for losing muscle in a deficit and even building muscle in a deficit or avoid gaining unwanted fat in the surplus. Now make sure when you are adjusting your calorie intake that you keep it small to start. So even tracking what you're currently doing and adjusting from there is a great way to do it over even finding some other calorie calculation because we're meeting yourself where we're at. When you're thinking about that deficit, think no more than 100 to 300 calories. Even think about if you are going to, towards that 300 calorie deficit, so that's 300 calories off of your daily intake, maintain whatever changes you make for a week or two before you make another change, but even start with just 100 calories off your current intake and then maintain that for a week and then maintain that for another week and then go and decrease even more. But don't just do a dramatic decrease. Not that you can't, but our body doesn't like changes and the bigger the change, the more it will sort of fight against it. Same thing goes for that surplus. You want to think, you know, I want to increase it slowly. You can even increase it up to 400 calories. And especially the more active you are or the leaner you are to start, the more you might want to think 300 to 400 calories surplus. But again, try and increase 100 calories to that daily intake and maintain that for a week and then increase from there. If you're less active and you're training still intensely, you know, it's a lifting, but it's not as active or you're not doing as much cardio, maybe you only go into a 200 calorie surplus. Same thing with the deficit. Again, your activity level will impact it. The more active you are, the more you might want to keep that surplus or that deficit small. We also have to consider other factors like lifestyle in terms of our weekends, right? A lot of us will be like, but I was good all week. And we see our weekends sabotaging the results we're actually getting. The more you might want to increase your calories on the weekend, the more you might need to create a little buffer during the week because the smaller the deficit, the more you can blow that deficit over the weekend. 
Same thing with the surplus. If you're already in a surplus and you made a bigger surplus and then you have those bigger days on the weekend, you're going to increase your surplus even more. And calories in versus calories out do matter as we're adjusting those macros. So depending on your priority in terms of your focus for body recomp, if it's gaining muscle first, do that calorie surplus while focusing on macros, at least hitting that 30% protein minimum. If your primary focus is fat loss first while still building and retaining lean muscle, go into that deficit again, focusing on protein. Macros really matter, guys, but that's how you want to determine whether you need that surplus or deficit while trying to achieve body recomp. So the three words that sum up what it takes to achieve results. Consistency matters most. Plain and simple. And I bring this up because it always makes me slightly uncomfortable when someone comments on one of my half naked photos with abs and says, oh, that's like a lot of hard work and so much discipline, which it is. I am not trying to deny that achieving a result we have never achieved before does take commitment. It takes owning our priorities. It takes hard work. It takes even embracing the heart of pushing through a lot of the things we've trained our body and mind to want to do, right? We have to unlearn old habits and relearn new ones to embrace a new identity and achieve the goals and results that we want. But I think often what sort of makes me go oh, and cringe a little bit when someone says that is that we think we can outwork or do so much hard work that we'll see results when a hard work without purpose and intentionality won't really pay off. But often we try and out exercise or out diet time. And that's what sabotages our long-term consistency because what we do consistently is what we get good at. That's what allows results to actually snowball. And when I've actually tried to achieve better and better results, the less I've actually done. And the more I focus on what's a 1% improvement I can make, the better my results have gotten because each and every time I'm sustaining the previous results and then building off of that. And that's what we have to remember, right? When we diet down, if we can't then maintain those habits and different things, we set ourselves up with failure, think we have to do all these extreme things and we can't do that any longer, we, we, we rebound. We haven't been able to build that sort of foundation we can then keep building off of. So as you're trying to make changes, as much as you might want to go all or nothing, and as much as you're going to have to embrace the hard and sometimes make some dramatic shifts, being more precise and like even doing a little bit more than you ultimately will need to do, you have to be conscious of your exit strategy and what's the foundation of everything you're doing. It's why no matter how much I might try and do it in more intense macro ratio or more intense workout schedule, I have that idea that, okay, I know I'm designing for this time, right? I know right now I'm designing for six days a week and I can design for three instead and still be efficient. I know right now I might be trying to shoot for 50% protein because I really do want to lean down, but that's not sustainable for me. But I also know that I can bump that down to 30% or increase my calories or decrease my calories. I know those fundamentals. And I think that's what's so key is that we understand there are fundamentals underneath everything that can help us be consistent. And then we've got to constantly be assessing our priorities right now. Okay. We don't often enough ask ourselves, what are my priorities right now? Is everything I'm doing in the day actually in line with the priorities that I have? Because when we do that, we find ways to do the minimum, even during tough times. Like if your priority right now is work because it's a busy season at work, make that your priority, own it, but find ways to be consistent with the other habits that are in line with what your priorities are right now. If you have a dead time at work and you know, you're like, Oh, I'm this perfect time to do, you know, a, a 21 day intensive stretch. Great. Own that. Focus on ways you can be consistent during that time, but don't be afraid to pause and assess what your priorities are at points to make sure that everything else is being adjusted towards that. So you can actually be consistent. You can make those 1% improvements. I actually was thinking about some good questions to ask ourselves when we're so often relying on hard work to try and out exercise or out diet time so that we can sort of say, Hey, if consistency matters most, what can I be asking myself to help myself be more consistent? So what's one easy change I can make right now, right? Often it can be really hard to get started because we feel overwhelmed with all the changes we need to make, the hard that we need to do. And so instead of trying to go for the hardest thing, what's one easy change you could make even while listening to this podcast right now, right? Because that's going to allow you to make those 1% improvements to allow results to snowball, to allow that consistency to build. Then what's the best way to work hard without trying to do too much? intentionality with our training, right? It's optimizing everything. It's like, how can I be as lazy as possible and still see progress? Again, it goes back to those easy changes to make, the low hanging fruit, right? Think about all the easiest changes you can make and make those first. Because often the changes right above those, the harder changes become a lot easier because we've already made the underlying changes. So the more we can think, how can I be as lazy as possible while moving forward, the better off we're gonna be over trying to overwhelm ourselves with all the different things we could be doing. So as often as we wanna go to, oh, well, I know my dessert is not healthy. I'm going to cut that out first. If that's the thing you love the most, that's going to sabotage you. So focus on the easy changes first. How can you 
put your hard work towards the effort that will maximize the results that it can build. And then how can I create a plan that makes me work more efficiently and do less, but all be focused effort. Again, it goes back to owning your priorities. What are your priorities right now? If it means training for three days a week, how can I design then efficiently for that actual time that I have? And the more we can do that, the more we're going to be training smarter, the more we're going to be fueling smarter, the more we're going to be fueling in a way that actually allows us to be consistent. Okay. Then even think what challenges have I faced that ultimately make me sabotage all of my hard work. What has made every other thing you've done in the past either work really well or ultimately cause you to sort of fall off and fail? Is it that you didn't plan for how you were going to sort of transition out of something like you did that intense macro ratio, but you didn't say, Hey, I know this is an intense macro ratio and I now understand macros and I can even ease back into maybe more even third split or, you know, Hey, I know I can do six days a week right now, but I'm also going to design a workout routine for three days a week at this other stage because I know I will only have that time. Think about the challenges you faced, what you've even pushed yourself to do in the past that hasn't been sustainable. Recognize that like, you know, maybe keto didn't work for you, but was it really keto or was it the fact that you said, I can't have X, Y, and Z foods. And then if it is that you couldn't have X, Y, and Z foods, going for another diet that cuts out other foods might be putting yourself in the same position. So instead say, okay, well, how can I find a balance of working in the foods that I love while also making the dietary changes that I need? But assessing what has caused us to fail, what has been a challenge in the past can really help us adapt and make those 1% improvements from our current lifestyle. The last thing I want you to ask is actually off of that. It's what's a 1% improvement I can make in how I handle those not so ideal times. Okay. It's really all well and good that, you know, during a, a month we can do a cut, we can do that 75 hard, we can do all those different things for a period of time, but ultimately what dictates our results and our lasting results. And then those results becoming even better because we're able to sustain them is 1% improvements during the times that feel like the imperfect time to make a change, the imperfect time to do anything, the times we wouldn't necessarily have done anything in the past. Those 1% improvements during that time are what add up to better results than even pushing extra hard during a perfect time. So just remember, you want to constantly be assessing your priorities and questioning everything that you're doing in a good way, questioning so that you can find ways to be more consistent and make your lifestyle really work better for you. Even thinking, Hey, how can I be lazier with things? Because even though you might want to end up doing more, you might train six days a week, even though you could only train three, it's good to know that you have those minimums that you can hit and still move forward. I'm super excited to share an interview I did with Christy of Eat Me Guilt Free. They are not only delicious brownies, but she has an amazing story and some great tips to give you perspective because one size really doesn't fit all when we're pursuing our goals. So let's jump in. Well, I'm super excited to have you on Christy to talk about creating our healthiest, happiest lifestyles and not having to cut out our dessert because I am a big dessert person, which led me to find Eat Me Guilt Free because I didn't want to cut it out. So can you talk a little bit about why you started creating such delicious macro-friendly items for people. Yeah. So basically for the reason that um, you just mentioned, there were so many people out there um, I that would constantly repeat to me. I was a, a sports nutritionist and a nurse in the emergency room. And I would hear the same thing over and over. It sounded kind of like, you know, broken record. I, I feel either guilty. I would hear two different things. I feel guilty. I, I had such and such a thing yesterday. So they would feel terrible about eating things that they loved, which is not a good place to live. Um, uh, or B, they just, you know, kind of always felt like they were lacking sweet things. So when I went into the kitchen, I started making like just regular mug cakes with protein shakes and things like this. Um, a few, I guess, hundred trials later, I ended up with a chocolate brownie and I started sharing it with my clients, my nutrition clients and and my friends, because at the time I was competing in figure because that was a long time ago. That was like 2010 or 2011 when I was messing around with it. And here we are several flavors later and, and bread. And it's been quite the journey. And it's really interesting to see the impact beyond just talking to one customer in front of your client. I think it's awesome that you've shown that you don't have to feel guilty, that you can enjoy the foods you love, because I think people feel like there's this one size fits all thing that they have to hit someone else's arbitrary standards of clean. What would you tell them even having gone to achieving like really more aesthetic goals yourself? Like, what would you tell someone looking to make changes? Yeah, I think that's a really big uh, thing to keep in mind that everyone is completely different. Everyone's definition of clean is definitely different. And what's going to work for you it's not what's going to work for me. That is, I know that sounds very cliche, but I, I think at least at Eat Me Go Free and the way that I like to look at things is I don't follow a specific style or 
like let's say you know people are like keto or paleo and all these things that have kind of um when we evolve um as far as our ingredient panel and, and what the macros are going to look like we kind of take into consideration all different things you know not that it's super super clean and it, yes as clean as it can be like basically we take the best of every different type of eating style or information that's out there and make and make something and make a brownie <laughs> out of it is what we've been what we've been doing here at Amy Gilfrey. And I think that's what we should do as individuals is kind of take all the information that's out there and kind of come up with what works best for you and your lifestyle and what goals you're trying to reach, if that's what you were asking. Yeah, that's perfect. I think it is one of these things we have to take a look at our lifestyle, be like, what matches our needs? How can I create something sustainable? And in that, what would you tell to someone saying, well, I still feel guilty for eating X, Y, and Z? Yeah, I mean, I I honestly, in the past, I've always said, then you probably need to do it more often, right? I said, as crazy as that sounds, because then you kind of get used to something when something's scary or something doesn't feel right. And it and it is, you you kind of introduce it more often. Sometimes when people are really live very regimented lives, the best way to do that is maybe, or an easy way to do that is to um, schedule it in. It's like, oh, I'm doing this twice a week, because then they still feel like, and they're slowly moving towards a level of not feeling guilty about food. Um, I think, you know, there's been so many different eating styles. Some people even just, you know, count all their macros and throw them all together. And and Go Free has kind of worked for all those different types of, so I've kind of heard all, you know, I heard it all in regards to, I still feel guilty about eating it. And I think it's not for everything including Amy Guilfrey is not for everyone, you know, like there are people who definitely feel that, you know, they're only going to eat whole, like real foods that are not processed. And yeah, sure. That makes sense to me, you know, just, it's not necessarily what I do all the time. And it's not what, I guess the product was created for people who, who want to eat, they're going to eat them anyway, you know? So we're just making a, a better version, the best that we can at the time. You're helping people meet themselves where they're at in terms of what they need. But I I love that way of putting it, like do it more often, because I do think part of what makes us feel guilty or what makes us feel afraid is that we don't know the impact something's going to have. And then we fear the impact, but we don't know. And we can't know until we actually do it. So by doing it more often, you can show yourself that nothing bad is going to happen. And you get to learn how your body reacts to things like, you know, uh, I'm sure you've come across like having foods, let's say that are high in sugar, having them at different times of the day, post work up, periodic hour, you get to learn how your body responds and what's sustainable. Like when you were talking about in the beginning, like learning how to incorporate different types of foods at different times. The only way you're going to know is trying it because you can read it all day long, but it might not be the way your body responds. And I think some of it is also finding our, our, our boundaries with things, finding our balance where it's not that you want to necessarily cut out like your full fat, full sugar brownies. Maybe those are part of your balance at points. However, also knowing that you can have an option that might fit your macros a little bit better, might drive a little bit more towards your goals. It's all about figuring out how we want to strike that balance for ourselves to actually move forward. Yeah, that, that perfect, like makes perfect sense. And I think that's why you know, the brand has done so well. Like some people really enjoy having some like late afternoon is a time where a lot of people crave like just some sort of a snack that's sweet. It seems that I've heard three to five o'clock. And I think that it fits that demographic. It fits the before bed because once you're backloading again, there's a way there are, there are different people in different eating styles that you can kind of make almost anything work. But the brownie, um, I think has those two I guess, types of humans that want to have something in the afternoon and before bed, something, having a low carb version has made it a lot easier for them. And I think it's amazing, not only what you've done with this brand, but just how much you promote women pursuing what matters to them. Because I think, you know, whether it's in dieting, whether or not it's in life, a lot of times women will put themselves Second, they make everything else a priority to try and be there for everybody else. And that's definitely something I like respect you for. You've, you've built this brand, you've pushed to help other women. Can you talk about, you know, being a woman and pursuing your goals and not being afraid to sort of like live boldly, be large, you know, like take charge? Yeah. I mean, I I can say that it's not always easy, right. In regards to sometimes you forget, even though you live 
a lifestyle that you try to put your own oxygen on, mask on first. I've noticed, um, I'm answering backwards, I've noticed that now, even though for the most part, for years, I've kind of tried to live that way, when too many things or too many wrenches get thrown in to the <laughs> into the mix, I find that I'll kind of slide back into um, not making sure that I'm taking care of myself first and and these sorts of things. And, and it's just a question of like what doing what you did in the beginning is reminding yourself, slowing down, implementing one small thing. Like I think it, sometimes if people are, they have a family or whatever it is, they have a tendency to, like you said, push everyone else ahead of themselves. And if you just start out with like one step, which I think works that way in business, whether you're a woman, whether you're a man, whatever it is, you deciding, okay, well, I'm going to take 15 minutes in the morning to journal every day, you know, come hell or high water. I think just making that initial step empowers you so much to kind of keep going once you've actually followed through with your first habit. So that's that's a little bit about how I started doing it and how I've been able to, once I fall out, get back in. It's just implementing one thing again. And once I've gotten there, but Amy Guilfrey has been, I don't know, I think now we're eight and a half years in. And it's been quite the journey in regards to, you know, I guess the whole entrepreneur thing. And, and as far as being a woman owned business, I didn't even realize kind of what that meant and how little, even though there are a lot of women businesses out there, as far as consumer packaged goods for me, I didn't really have peers to kind of talk to that were doing the same thing. So I think it's good to share, you know, now that there's social media platforms and different digital ways to communicate. I think it's good to share how you do it, how you feel. And I think you'll we'll find new strength that way because you'll find new ideas and how to, you know, kind of kind of keep building yourself as a person. I think that's a great like thing to remember is I we get wrapped up in even trying to like lone wolf things. Well, I don't need accountability, I don't need support, but it's not just about the fact that you might not know how to do something or you you need support or, you know, like you can maybe be motivated on your own, but at the same time, if you can avoid mistakes because you can learn from others, it's going to be super beneficial. And it reminds you, you know, sometimes you, you had a habit, like, let's say that was awesome and it really worked for you. You kind of fall out of it. You'll hear someone else talking about it and you're like, oh, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to restart that. It's not like specifically, yeah, you're going to learn something new every time or that you, you right. I, I, I have a tendency to, I guess, I don't want to say stand alone. I've been a single mom most of my parent, parent or all, all the time that I've been a parent. So I want to say that I guess I've never, I've been the type to not really look for support, even though now I I see the strength and vulnerability, you know, and in sharing. Um, but yeah, there's just so many different, I guess, benefits to hearing what other people have to say. You learn so much. Even realizing that you're not alone in your struggles and that most people don't start out with every situation going the way they want. They don't have these perfect plans. There's not something special. I mean, there's obviously, you know, special people, people with talents, but there's not necessarily a, they had to have X, Y, and Z in their life in order to succeed. Like even with building Eat Me Guilt Free, you started in your kitchen. You didn't necessarily have this like perfect situation to build all these different things. And yet you pursued what really mattered to you. What would you tell someone doubting that they have the tools, the time, the resources to really move forward towards their goals? I think the most important thing isn't necessarily the talent or situation. I think one of the most important elements and what I have noticed has brought me a lot of success in different avenues and aspects of my life, including Amy Free, is, you know, I guess, like kind of sticking to things, you know, consistency is huge, even if it's not 100%, because people will beat themselves up also, if they're not doing it 100% of the time. But if most of the time you're doing what you are aligned to do as far as your vision and what your goals are, you're going to get there, you know, if it's over, I would say over 80% of the time, better if it's 90 or 95. But if it's over 80% of the time, you're going to get there. And what would you tell someone who encounters a setback? Because I know anytime we do have those struggles, we think there's something wrong with us. And that's usually what throws off our consistency. What would you tell to someone like who's like, I just can't do it on the willpower. You know, I had these just struggles and challenges. I guess it's the same concept of, you know, we all have 24 hours in a day. So we all have, I guess, 
this level of motivation or the ability to stay consistent. It's just a question of of deciding, right? And I think when you haven't decided, you don't realize that. And I think for me, taking the time to really write down what I think I want as far as my goals help me align with what it is. And I, you know, because sometimes you think this is my goal. Oh my God, I feel so terrible. I haven't been able to reach it. And it, it's more than likely because it's not your priority right now. And and that's okay, but you can set a timeline for this is my priority and this is what I'm going to focus on, you know, depending on how much you're into like objective numbers, you know, 30, 60, 90 or whatever it is. But I think that we're human and for there are certain constants, you know, and it's just a question of taking the time for yourself, like we talked about earlier, and figuring out, is this really my goal? Is this really my priority? And if it is, where does it fall? You know, and and kind of like, I love to journal. I think it helps bring all that out and you start to really figure out things. You beat yourself up less, I think. You know, how you're, how, how you're just asking, what do you tell people? I think it's really figuring out if this is what you want. Because if not, you're just beating yourself up for no reason. It's not your goal. It's not that you can't. It's that it's not what you want to do. <laughs> And with journaling, what do you feel like is the most beneficial part of that in terms of giving you that perspective? I guess it's similar to um, maybe what people say happens in therapy when you're speaking out loud and you hear yourself say it, you know, you're just in conversation. I think the same things happen when you're writing out your ideas because, you know, there's different forms. I don't stick to just like in food. I don't stick to one particular style depends on how I'm feeling and where I am in life. Sometimes I'm just writing down everything that comes to mind. And that for me makes me feel less heavy because I've kind of written it down, it's gone. Um, but I do think that writing for me, writing down what it is that I want and kind of what I'm doing or what that would look like. For me, it helps me really figure out if what I'm doing every day aligns with what I just wrote down. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think that's awesome. It gives you perspective. And so often we get caught up in doing more, trying to work harder, putting in more effort that we forget about how important the efficiency of work is. And I think when you're journaling, you're taking that step back to assess, like, what am I doing? What actually matters? It gives you that perspective so that you can work a little bit smarter over just working harder. Yeah. You're not running around in circles. And, and, and I guess, like you said, I think a lot of times we don't give ourselves a lot of credit. And I think another thing that I have found that makes you feel, I guess, better about yourself, right, is looking back. And that's something that other people have brought to my attention. It's not something I learned on my own. Like, look at where you were last year, or where you were five years ago, or where you were last month. Sometimes, yeah, you may have rolled backwards, but if you look back six months ago, you weren't even aware that the problem existed. So I think most of the time you'll find that you've made a lot more progress than you think you have. And it'll kind of, I guess, motivate you to keep going. It also, when you're pausing even to reflect, be like, oh, maybe I need to do this more often to prevent six months from accumulating and only maybe three months or then the next time three weeks, right? It just helps us make sure that we're actually assessing where we're going, avoid any pitfalls, plan better for the future, right? Because we're going to make mistakes. We're human. Of course. And, you know, I mean, even if you look at things from like a mathematical point of view, there's like this line that's zero, there's negative one, there's plus one. It's kind of the way things work. You know, it's science. It's it's not like a hocus pocus thing. I think you're going to have bad days, you're going to have good days. And it's, it's the ebbs and flows. It's kind of part of life. You can't know the good without the bad, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we say it a lot of times. And then I think when we kind of get hit with the bad, we are like, oh my God, I don't understand why this is happening. And it's happening because the good happened. And it's kind of part of the the ups and downs. Just got to, I guess, try to remember that when you're going through either one. It's hard to have that perspective for sure. And it's hard to reach out for help. I know that you do have even grants for women looking to build their businesses. And I'd like to just touch on that. While I'm you know, all about the fitness and that's my expertise, I do think that's just such a great opportunity. And I think it highlights such an important thing of not being afraid to reach out, not being afraid to take a risk on ourselves. Yeah. So the You Glow Girl grant was uh, part of Eat Me Guild Free's initiative to help other women entrepreneurs. Because like I mentioned before, I didn't really have a lot of peers or, or mentors when I was kind of 
um, for starting. And it's, it is a $10,000 grant that we, this would be our third year when we launched it, that we choose a winner. Um, but it's a more holistic, um, which kind of falls into what you talk about. It does include your physical body, your mental fitness. Um, I think the first year we gave Pella's on away because it was like the pandemic. The second year was like class pass because that's a really important piece. You know, like I can feel it when I don't work out and or like when the time changes or I didn't, I have to work out in the evening versus the morning. I, I feel different. And I think your, your, your chemistry and, and what you're doing physically really affects your brain as an entrepreneur. So the Uglo Girl Grant, um, which is Amy Gilfrey's, you know, answer to helping women's entrepreneurs includes that, that piece of the puzzle, you know, um, I don't know. Yeah, the whole physical portion has has changed drastically for me. Like I was super into only lifting. Then I want to say I got really, really into yoga, which is something that if you would have asked me five years ago, I would have like, no, I couldn't even sit in the class for 15 minutes. So it's funny how you kind of evolve and change and start to blend everything together. Yeah, it, it's... One, nothing works forever, A, and B, it is fun to explore new things, meet ourselves where we're at, both mind, body, and soul. And so I think being open to those evolutions in our diet, in our lifestyle, in what we want to pursue, you know, business-wise, lifestyle-wise, and even in our workouts is so important. For sure. I think it's 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 always fun because I like trying new things. I like change to some degree, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that for me, yoga, yes, I guess is a form of, of, of workout. But for me, it was more of how I learned how to meditate because I couldn't sit still. So the concept of the movement, connecting movement and breath was how I started to get to be able to look inwards and then it started to become easier to journal, et cetera, et cetera. So I still obviously love lifting weights, going to the track, everything else, but I just kind of blend both in. And you're right. I think, I think at different points in your life, whether as an entrepreneur, as a woman, as a, as an athlete, you're going to need different things. But also it teaches us stuff. Just like you mentioned, like it allowed you to meditate, to look inward, to be more reflective. I think so often we don't recognize how much the gym, our training sessions is like that, that little ecosystem where we can build sort of who we want to be, or even other habits that we wouldn't necessarily take time to build outside. Like we can find empowerment through like lifting and feel stronger and more confident to, to ask for a raise or do whatever else, right? We can become a little bit more reflective through it. It really is that perspective building space. I, I really believe that. I think that what I did, I guess, early on when I was just for starting to help other people in sports nutrition. And I was just kind of competing in figure, which was kind of popular back then. I think it really made me confident because I was able to follow through with what I was, you know, the workouts that I would plan and where I was trying to reach. And I think it helped me be more confident to try in my, in my career, new things, you know, I'm like, if I can do that, you know, I didn't say to myself, if I can do this, I can do something else, but I think you just feel that way. Yeah, I was going to say, you become more comfortable being uncomfortable and that challenge and showing yourself your strength to overcome those hurdles. Maybe it's just lifting five more pounds, but it's still overcoming that hurdle where you're like, yeah, I can do this. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think as, I mean, at least as I've gotten older, um, even learning how to like train and work around injuries is something that you have to do in other pieces of your life as well. You know, not just when you're working out, you kind of have to like work around things. You don't just stop. You shouldn't right? Shouldn't just stop working out. Shouldn't just stop talking to your sister. You know, you have to kind of like work around issues. And I think there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of correlations and I think it's, we're not meant to be sedentary. So there's, there's definitely to something to the fact that it's so therapeutic for most people. I literally love that about working around injuries because I always preach that in gym. I'm like, you got to find ways to work around, to rebuild, regress to progress. And I have to admit, that's probably the first time that I'm like, oh my goodness, yes. In everyday life, you have to find ways to work around, to regress, to progress. It's just- and It doesn't feel good. Yeah. Doesn't, you don't have to like decrease the amount of weight you can do or what you're able to do. And it doesn't feel good when you have to kind of start over, you know, in at work or whatever it is. So it's it's similar, you know, and I think having to have, have done that with injuries has helped me, you know, do it with work like when you know things don't go the way i plan i have to do it a different way it's not the first time i've ever had to do it you know well, that, that is spot on and like 
probably one of the best lessons we can take. And I think, you know, sometimes we don't want to do it in the gym, but we do it in everyday life and we've done it in the gym and haven't done it in everyday life. And it's starting to see those correlations that really pay off. For sure. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to say it's really cool um, that we have platforms and, and people talking about, I guess, the importance of strength and working out. And, and like I was saying earlier, I think all of these digital platforms and being able to communicate and talk about things that are relevant for, I would say, a lot of people. Like I said, we're not meant to be sedentary. It's huge. Humongous. I'm sure you've witnessed that, I guess, when, with the response that you get. It's awesome to get to get, like connect and share different perspectives and all of that stuff. And speaking of which, I'd love for you to let everybody know where they can reach you, Christy, if they want to learn more about Eat Me Guilt Free and learn more about the grants and just everything. I will be linking to this in the show notes as well so that if anybody wants to click and check it out, they can, but let them know where they can find you. Perfect. So um, Eat Me Guilt Free's Instagram is Eat Me Guilt Free. And so is the Facebook and TikTok. And mine is Christy Basu, which is C-R-S-T-I-E-B-E-S-U. And the grant you can on our website and on, on my Instagram profile as well. But it's you Glow Girl grant. So very exciting. I'm looking forward to anyone who wants to learn more about any of those. Well, thank you so much, Christy. This was amazing and so many great tips and perspectives shared. Thank you, Corey. Simple and delicious meal prep. I know it can be hard to come up with ideas to hit your macros, so we either get into a rut eating the same thing, or if you're lazy like me, you don't want to put a ton of effort into it, but you want diversity in food. So I actually challenged one of my dietitians, Julia, to come up with six different recipes using only six ingredients and two staple ingredients. And so in this case, we use chicken and rice, but this can really be anything that you prefer. It could be tofu and potatoes. It could be steak and pasta. You want to think about two ingredients you always have on hand that you can not only get frozen, but also get fresh very easily. And then you want to think about all the different ways you can use these different things. So I like to think about different types of cuisine I like. Like I might think, you know, burrito bowl Mexican. I might think of an Italian dish. I might think, you know, Indian curry. And then I'll think of all the different ways I can use those two ingredients to have different flavors. And then I want to think about what's the simplest way to have some staple pantry ingredients so that I can use if I prep chicken and rice in all these different ways. And it usually relates back to having a variety of sauces, maybe even having some frozen vegetables and other things that you can add in in a pinch. Canned goods, frozen goods are a great way to add diversity to your meal prep without having things that can go bad and also still have a lot of nutrient density. I know we often demonize them, but they can be great. And frozen vegetables are actually usually frozen at the peak of ripeness. So it might even be better than fresh in some arguments. But you want to think about how can I take those two staples and use them in a variety of different ways. So I will share with you a great handout she made that has six recipes with six ingredients used six different ways. But think about what macros you have to hit, the types of foods you like to include. So if you have that chicken and rice, you could add pesto, tomato, mozzarella, and broccoli and have a baked chicken pesto. Or if you have that chicken and rice, you could maybe cut your carbs a little bit by using less rice, adding in cauliflower rice, then mixing in frozen vegetables, sesame oil, and soy sauce for that stir fry or fried rice. You could even use chicken and rice with some beans and then lettuce and salsa and some cheese and make a little taco salad. And that could be lower fat, especially if you use lower fat cheese. You could also do like a Greek chicken bowl using chicken, rice, sliced cucumber, red onion, feta cheese, and hummus. And all these different things will be simple ways to take those two staples with the other ingredients that you have or other ingredients that you can buy. Again, even using like the canned beans or the frozen vegetables so that in a pinch or if you need to adjust your macros based on what you ate earlier in that day, you can easily then tweak based on what you need to hit in terms of your macros or even what you have on hand. But these give you diversity so that you can be prepping two main things and using in so many other ways. Teriyaki chicken is another option where you have still the chicken, the rice, but you add in the bell pepper, you add in the green onions, soy sauce, and honey. And again, you're using the soy sauce again in two different ways for two different recipes. Or if you want something maybe where you add in a little extra chicken and you do that buffalo chicken, which I love buffalo chicken, you can have that hot sauce. I put Frank's on everything anyway, so I always have it on hand, but you can do chicken, rice, buffalo sauce, those uh, black beans or, that you even use in that taco salad, and then you can have broccoli and then some shredded cheese as well. But this shows you that it doesn't have to be complicated to make a diversity of meals so that you don't have to feel like you're eating the same thing over and over again, but you're not also prepping a bazillion different things. Two staples, some common things you can have in your fridge and your pantry, and then you can mix it up. If you want that cheat sheet, go to the show notes. I'll also link it out on YouTube so that you can really check that out. I'd love to hear how you use your staples in different ways to make your meal prep fun. 
So when we think about losing fat and gaining muscle at the same time or gaining muscle while not gaining fat, we often think bodybuilding. And when we think about bodybuilding workout splits, often we think about body part splits, right? Chest, shoulders, triceps, back and biceps, quads and calves, right? Those type of splits. And it's very interesting that this has become known as the bodybuilding splits because if you actually look at a lot of advanced bodybuilding techniques, they weren't broken down into these schedules. And especially if you have fewer times to train in the week, this is not going to benefit you in terms of those aesthetic goals as much as you really can see benefits training less. And I think it's actually what has led to us feeling like we need to do more or do two a days to see results because those workouts are designed to be two-a-day sessions. A lot of times those competitors are doing extra cardio. They have their diet dialed in specifically. That is for a specific competition where you are dedicating a lot more time than the average person, I know myself included, really has to dedicate, and it's for a specific sport. So if you're looking to train three, four, five times a week and be efficient with it, and you're potentially not doing some other things for competition, you wanna think, how can I be more efficient in my training? How can I even increase my training frequency? So let's ditch the body part splits and focus on full body, anterior, posterior, so front side versus back side, or hemisphere. Hemisphere, if you're only gonna be training at least four times or more, the other two if you're even thinking about three times a week. And the reason for doing this is you're gonna work more large muscle groups per session, which is gonna help you burn more calories, build more muscle in a shorter amount of time. It's going to pack a lot more bang for your buck and also have a lot of functional benefits in terms of moving better in your everyday life. So if you are shorter on time, if you are really trying to grow muscle and maintain your leanness level, and you're a person who doesn't wanna spend two, three hours in the gym, just maybe you'd like to, but you don't have the time, focus on those more compound movements and those more full body splits. Because with three days a week, if you're hitting every area, you're gonna be also in increasing that training frequency, which is so, so valuable. Re recent studies have shown that actually training an area more frequently, especially if it's a stubborn area, can really provide great benefit in terms of muscle hypertrophy or muscle growth. With that body part split, especially if you happen to miss a session, you're potentially not training something for at least seven days again, if not longer. So by actually doing full body splits, even three days a week, we're gonna see really great benefits because of that training frequency. You want to be conscious of how many reps, how many sets you're doing in a single session so that you do have time to repair and rebuild. But you're going to see really great benefits if you do like that heavy hip thruster for your glutes. And then maybe another day you do more of a pumper based movement that second day. And then you go back to maybe deadlift on another day. That way you're hitting it with different postures and positions, different types of drivers of muscle growth, right? More mechanical tension with the hip thruster, more of that muscle tissue damage with the deadlift, and then more of a pumper movement that allows you actually more recovery because it won't create the same muscle tissue damage or soreness, right? So you're hitting it three times with three different drivers of muscle growth, using all of them to see the best benefit. So if you are looking to gain muscle and lose fat at the same time, ditch the body part splits and focus on more full body type workouts just to be more efficient. And then in those, if you do have more than three days to train, you can start to include isolation moves for those stubborn areas, especially at the end of your workouts. But if you're really short on time and you got 30 minutes, three days a week, Compound exercises are gonna give you great bang for your buck. But don't let the excuse that you don't have enough time to see the body recomposition that you want hold you back because it doesn't have to be the case. We often get that attitude, as I said, because we see those two-day workout splits where they're doing body part because they're just trying to even move more to burn more calories for competition. But we don't have to do that. We can design for the time we have and see great results. Well, that's a wrap for this episode of the Fitness Hacks Podcast. I hope these tips were helpful if you are looking to achieve amazing body recomp gaining that lean muscle as you lose fat. It is possible guys, just remember we always have to assess where we're at currently to build off of our current lifestyle.